Previously, Binkov went in-depth on the hardware that the Russian ground forces are using. But an army doesn't win wars just with tanks and rifles. Training, experience and logistics is what often decides battles. So this video will try to explore those, as well as cover the other Russian ground forces, such as airborne, naval infantry and even their National Guard. In Russia, everything can be bigger. The Russian army has a long history and sometimes its experiences, like those in the war in Afghanistan, influenced its modern army. This video is sponsored by CuriosityStream, a subscription streaming service that offers thousands of documentaries. Afghanistan 1979, the war that changed the world, is just one of the documentaries I liked, teaching me more about the decade-long Soviet military campaign that helped bring down the USSR. Many more documentaries and non-fiction titles are offered on CuriosityStream, coming from some of the world's best filmmakers. There are new shows added weekly, including exclusive originals. CuriosityStream is available worldwide on a myriad of platforms, and Binko viewers will find it extremely affordable. Go to curiositystream.com slash Binkov, use the promo code Binkov and get 25% off. Basically, a whole year of subscription for just $14.99. So if you're a learning nerd, if you like science, nature, history, technology and much more, give it a try and enjoy unlimited access to world's best documentaries. Looking at the composition of Russian ground forces, it's apparent that Russia has fewer logistics and support units than the US. For the size of its combat component, that is. It's something Russia is aware of, as there are plans to add more logistics units on the divisional level. Today, Russian regiments are light on support units compared to the US brigades, which have almost as much command and support units as combat ones. This ratio changes in favor of support, command and overhead once the total US army personnel is tallied. Back in the Cold War, Soviet motor rifle divisions and regiments were super heavy on combat stuff, leaving the same meager 18% for support and command for both levels. Russia has increased that ratio somewhat closer to the current US army levels, but just by how much is hard to tell. If the Russian army used the ratio of added support and overhead personnel similar to the US one, using the known combat unit count and personnel estimate, then the Russian army would have way more personnel than it does, which it clearly doesn't. Hence the relative lack of support personnel. Once the adjusted figure of combat units, including army aviation, is compared to the overall adjusted figure of personnel connected to the Russian army. Basically, the ratio may be the reverse of the one in the US army. It's only a rough estimate, but it's safe to say it is higher than it was in the Soviet era. When it comes to budgeting, Russian land forces have, on the average, required far more money than the air forces or the navy. Compare that with the average US spending and it's evident land forces are the king of the usual triad of branches. The same time period is helpful for looking at where the Russian budget stands when it comes to personnel salaries. The budget money going to soldiers' pay amounted to 46%. Compare that to the US military pay and benefits which constitute 34% of the US budget. Why is that important? Well, it shows that it's quite hard for the Russian military to grow any larger or more professional than it currently is, without serious changes to budgeting or using more conscripts. And using fewer conscripts is exactly what the Russian military, ground forces included, has been all about for the last 20 years. Where professional soldiers were few and far between in the year 2000, they've been hovering around 400,000 for the last 5 years, for the whole military. Which is kind of a problem, too. The Russian military wanted to increase their numbers even more, at one time planning 500,000 contract soldiers by 2025. But money is not unlimited and those plans shrank to fewer professional troops, with the deadline now being 2030. Indeed, most contract soldiers in the Russian military get close to or little over median Russian salary. So it's not surprising that a part of the Russian military is still composed of conscripts, serving one year which get a measly monthly allowance. Still, as said, the Russian military keeps a decent number of professional soldiers. Allegedly, no maneuver unit, meaning units primarily tasked with fighting, contain conscripts. Conscripts are relegated to support duties. Contract soldiers are rough analogues to US Army soldiers. 
they sign a contract for two years or sometimes a few years longer. That's similar to the US system where enlisted serve a minimum of two years in the active duty, though the US averages closer to four years of active duty. However, the US servicemen have to serve eight years in total, with the remaining years spent in reserves. Since the Russian army still doesn't have a fleshed out reservist system, the similarities end there. For the last decade, Russia has struggled to create a large trained reservist force. Local command efforts would sometimes yield forces of 5 to 8 thousand reservist troops, undergoing refresher training courses. Recently, there's been a new push in the Russian southern military district to create a force of 38 thousand reservists. Ex-military personnel will be able to sign a 3 to 5 year reservist contract. They might then be called to mobilize, train or even do combat. It is still too early to say what will happen with that plan. Right now, Russian law considers most males of suitable age reservist worthy. In theory, that's over 2 million men. In practice though, Russian generals Bolyarev and Makarov said they expect 300 to 700,000 ex-military to be successfully mobilized as reservists in case of a big war. One area where Russian ground forces are quite strong in theory is storage of old military hardware, for use in the event of a total war where many reservists and the civilian population as well would have to be mobilized. While the US Army also has lots of old equipment stored, Russian stores are a few times bigger. Of course there are issues, it's impossible to tell just how well preserved all that Russian hardware is. At the same time, stored amounts have been dropping quite a bit, so maybe that signals that a part of what's claimed is at least somewhat usable in practice. There is also of course the matter of training and experience, though that's much harder to quantify. The Russian army did increase their abysmal training rates from the 2000s onwards, including now regular exercises with other countries. Since 2013, snap exercises with no warning started, with the number of major snap drills arising from 12 to 18 by 2014. Total exercise numbers rose further by 2015. Very large exercises such as Zapad, Vostok and others are done regularly. Vostok 2018 famously involved 300,000 military personnel, though realistically not more than 100,000 combat troops might have been involved. Now, all that still doesn't tell us much about capability levels, but given that professional soldiers increased in numbers, exercises increased in numbers and complexity, and actual participation in war ops continued, it's safe to say the Russian military is probably better trained now than it ever was, now or in Soviet era. Allegedly, one Russian general said it's cheaper for the Russian army to fight in Syria than to organize training exercises in Russia. Indeed, from 2015 onward, Russia has been rotating contingents of their military in Syria, keeping them three to four months in theater to gain experience. Before that, Russian troops were gaining experience in eastern Ukraine. The elite part of the troops meant to do ground combat certainly train a lot. Airborne Corps infantry would probably be the first to react in any war. Their list of training exercises is impressive. A single airborne regiment was on record to have performed these following exercises in a half year period. If one tried to answer the question of just how well trained Russian troops are compared to say US ones, a very rough estimate might look something like this. Competency there meaning ability to wage war in a broad set of surroundings and experience with cooperating with other military assets. Those items are also the reasons why the US Army Reserve is last on its side of the list. Its units are not meant for combat, but are various logistics and other support units. Also, unstructured Russian reserves still score similarly to the Russian National Guard. On one hand, the Guard is a part professional, part conscript force, but on the other, it's not trained to do combined arms maneuvers. The reserves might still have some leftover combined arms experience from the time when they served in the army. The Russian National Guard is an internal security force, a light infantry and police in a sense. It's not even a part of the Russian military, but a parallel organization reporting to the Russian president. Besides internal security, it is tasked with anti-terrorism and border defense, though in case of a war it would perform certain other defense duties. Overall personnel numbers are big, but the operational field units suggest actual troops on the ground to be less numerous. 
then again, some of its units do use military-grade armored vehicles and even a token number of light Todd howitzers. As for the aforementioned Airborne Corps, that too isn't part of the ground army, but they are of course part of the military. In the Russian system, the Airborne Corps is an independent force, reporting directly to the commander-in-chief or his delegated operational commanders. Back in 2012, the Airborne Corps numbered 35,000. Big plans were announced around that time that each division would get a third regiment. Yet it became evident that most of that size increase did not happen, perhaps due to finances. Even today, the downward revised personnel goal is not yet reached. In actuality, the Airborne Corps today numbers between 45 and 50,000. Comparing that to the US Airborne units, it's a slightly higher number. Though the US figure pertains only to Army's units, the US Marines also have additional air assault units. Direct comparison is further hampered by the fact the US units involve a greater number of aviation and logistics personnel. So the power projection far outside Russian borders is probably not that effective. Though Russian Airborne can airdrop armored infantry fighting vehicles in large numbers. While the US Airborne only recently started to reintroduce similar vehicles and mostly airdrops Humvees. Let us also just mention the ground forces of the Russian Navy. The closest US equivalent would be the Marine Corps. Russian naval infantry has also grown in recent years, even more so percentage-wise than the Airborne Corps. Yet it's way smaller than the US Marine Corps, possibly by three times over. As the average Russian battalion is almost half the size of the US Marine battalion. That being said, Russian naval infantry units have heavier systems. Those include tanks, which the US Marines got rid of, as well as medium-range SAMs, which the US Marines again lack. Of course, Russian naval infantry is mostly meant to protect the coast and perform limited-scale operations taking various nearby islands. It's far less capable of large-scale amphibious landings compared to the US Marines. Russia simply doesn't have either the helicopter or landing ship numbers of the US. Helicopters are just not meant to support the Russian army, the way some other countries use them. In Russia, the transport helicopter fleet is sized to handle the Airborne Corps. It lacks thousands of helicopters to be really comparable to the US Army helicopter fleet, which serves its entire army. Russian infantry units are just not as mobile as US ones, as they prioritize other areas. All those Russian helicopters are officially part of the Air Force, of course, so while we're at it, why not mention the combat helicopters as well? What is increasingly part of the Russian army are drone aircraft. Allegedly, Russia operates some 4,000 drones, though the vast majority of those are tiny ones. Right now, the three most used models are the Forpost family, based on the Israeli searcher drones, homegrown Aileron 3, and the Zastava, based on Israeli Birdeye 400. Besides Aileron, other homegrown drones are increasingly joining the force more potent 4 post R has started production. Despite all the novel additions, the future of the Russian ground forces is murky, as always. It's not just about the hardware, but also about personnel. It's about finances, training, getting more non-commissioned officers, which is also one area where the Russian army stumbled. In past reforms, it got rid of many such positions while it streamlined its numbers, and now the army is bringing back some of those NCO positions as they realize they lack in that middle-level command tier. Nevertheless, the Russian ground army is a very powerful beast, especially when protecting Russia's own borders, for which it was after all created. Against a medium-sized or even large but not very united opponent, it might prove to be very capable in various near-border wars. As long as it doesn't have to project its power a thousand miles away from its borders, the Russian army might be very quick to react and very lethal to its neighbors, if there ever comes to such a war. And remember, Binkov may talk about hypothetical wars, but only real peace can bring us all together.